USDA enlisted people, somebody to, an artist to watercolor this apple in 1903. And basically, give or take maybe 10 years, this is the last time an apple like this was deemed suitable for market. This, is, this was what apples used to look like in the marketplace. It's got sooty blotch, it's got fly speck, both are cosmetic diseases, and until about 1914, when the Cooperative Extension Service was founded on the backs of bankers, uh, railroad tycoons, and merchants, um, this all of a sudden disappeared. And what we have today, as a result, are these glistening orbs of perfection in the grocery store that really have no use um, other than just, I guess, just to eat them. Um, but this, <laughs> but I mean like eating out of hand, like I want, yeah, or to throw. Um, but anyway, this apple, this apple's called a doula beauty. It's my family apple. Uh, my great, great grandfather um, cultivated it. It's like a two pound apple, it's enormous. And it was of importance back then because it was post-Civil War. People were looking for something beautiful. People came from far and wide and this apple was shipped across the country. So anyway, just looking at this, this was the last time that this apple was deemed suitable. But in this realm of new fruit culture, we're gonna bring back this apple, whether the haters, I guess, or, or whether the uh, conventional guys like it or not, because this is quality. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, but first of all, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on me. Um, <clears throat> I am a trained heirloom apple orchardist. I've apprenticed under some very old men and for, for several years. And, and basically to learn how to grow hundreds of varieties of fruits that nobody's ever eaten before. And I don't, I, I don't really know how I got into heirlooms other than I just got into apples and then heirlooms happened. But I remember I was, with, I was working with this man named Francis Fenton, who's 97 years old. And I was also living with Francis Fenton. And he, uh, he always was trying to discourage me. Like, Liza, why don't you become a nurse? Or, Liza, why don't you go work at Olive Garden? Because, <laughs> because there's no money in apples. No, that was the, that's all I ever heard. There's no money in apples, there's no money in apples. And this is what we were growing. He had 175 varieties of apples on his property in a five acre plot. And you know, the apples had russet, like right here. Let me make sure this isn't gonna go. Okay. The apples had russeted um, uh, bits about them. They were, small, they were small, they were really large. You know, they had specks, they had bumps, they had, they had lumps. They just weren't your typical apple. And so, you know, and I, I was really hell-bent on making some money out of these apples because I did not want to work at Olive Garden. <laughs> and, so, and so I started to think, how am I going to sell these apples to people who don't want to buy something that, they, they're just not interested in buying something that's not the status quo, that's not the image we see um, at the grocery store. They're afraid. I mean, heck, I mean, any blemish, any mark these days, if you talk to somebody, um, who, who isn't in this room, uh, they, they'll think, oh my God, is that a worm? Like people are so terrified of worms um, or anything. And so it's really been, it was really a challenge. So I was thinking, how am I gonna make money growing these apples? Because this is what I love to do. I love this. Um, and so I started to look further into niche markets, um, specifically process markets because it doesn't matter what these apples look like in a processed form, but it does matter what they taste like, and it does matter what other qualities they can give. And so I entered into um, sort of devout research of, of processed fruit, and I came up with, okay, well, <clears throat> if I press these apples, I can make apple cider vinegar, I can make hard cider, and I can make cider syrup. And so I was thinking, okay, well, what would it take for me to make the best apple cider vinegar, hard cider, and cider syrup? And so I began this quest of quality 
Because I, you know, like, I was realizing, and even this was eight years ago, and so, and this was before Hard Cider really, like, started to boom in the United States, but I was realizing that this, these products that are on the market today, are, even today, are really not that great. Um, and so what could I do? And it, they're not that great because they're based on the waste stream. Like, they're based on even certified organic brags. You can't find any information about those apples. They, they don't talk about the apples that they use because it's a waste stream product. It's an organic waste stream product, but still, it's dessert fruit. It's not fruit that's intended to be made into vinegar, necessarily. So, and same thing for hard cider, same thing for cider syrup. I'll go into the, that stuff in a minute. But So I contacted um, this man named Renato Vincente, uh, who's an Italian, like, suave, he makes food, he's like, he talks about food like sex. It was just like, he's so, I mean, you just, you just melt when he's talking to you about the wine he's made or the food he's eaten or the ingredients because he's so passionate about it that it just makes you, whew, it makes you hot and bothered. So, <laughs> so I was talking to him about it, I was like, Renato, I want to make some quality apple cider vinegar. How do I do this? And, and he's with the Slow Food USA. And he said, well, I've got this 400-year-old vinegar mother that's a family heirloom. But you have to do this vinegar mother with 13% alcohol, or else your, your cider vinegar is going to be complete shit. And so I thought, sorry, I have to get some water. So that turned on a light. 13% alcohol. That's, that's booze, you know, that's wine. And I, and I said, oh, well, do, are you adding sugar? And he's like, no, I'm not adding sugar. That's the apple, you know, or that's the grape. Like, that's quality, where you're selecting fruits that are intentioned for this product. And so I was like, aha, the same thing happens with, cider, with hard cider. You need, you need a whole breadth of, of different uh, you know, tastes and textures and alcohol percentages and everything, and it can all be fed, to, fed into this cider by the kind of apples you grow, or the pears, or whatever, whatever fruit you're using. And cider syrup, you're saving yourself a, hell, a heck of a lot of money if you pick an apple that has a very high sugar content as opposed to an apple that doesn't. Because uh, you know, it's like with maple syrup or something. You know, as you're boiling your sap down, the higher the sugar percentage, the, uh, the less liquid it takes. So cider syrup is like an 8 to 1 if you're using, maybe a 7 to 1, even a 6 to 1 if you're using an apple or a pear or persimmon or whatever that has a very high sugar content. Um, okay, so... So I started to, I sort of, I, I like became alive in, in, in sort of uncovering this. Like, oh, okay, the reason why people grew fruits a long time ago were for purposes. Like, and today, due to uh, sort of this homogenization that's hit the United States uh, because of the, and I'm really going to, bang up on the Cooperative Extension Service because they did a lot of bad things to the diversity in the United States. But, you know, the reason <clears throat> all those purposes went out the door for apples that stored well, apples that produced, fruits that stored well, that produced annually, that produced heavily, um, and so, and that, were, and that were big. And so with that, you know, we lost those, we lost the high sugar. We lost the high, well, we have some high acidity still in American heirlooms, but we lost a lot of the traits that make products really high quality. And that's, that's where I want to talk to you today in terms of these niche markets. Like, right now, we are in a situation where, where uh, these, 
our niche markets, our cider market, you know, there's like a whole, it, at least in hard, I'm well, I work in the hard cider industry and I'm like well versed with the really shitty ciders that are made from apple cider concentrate or yeah, well, apple cider concentrate from like China or the United States, it doesn't matter. It's like red delicious stuff. And then you have these people on the other spectrum who are making uh, what they're calling orchard cider, you know, out of more cider varieties. Yet there's nobody talking about how these fruits are being grown. That's the big secret here. And, and you know, if you look at uh, food culture as it is right now in America, we are, people are really starting to wake up. Um, <clears throat> and so people are starting to want, they, they want to know, or at least they don't, if they don't want to know, you should tell them how things are being grown. Because that's a part of an awareness that's, that needs to be pushed forward. And that awareness um, will only help to further this cause of growing like in a more permaculture way for um, niche markets. OK, back then, people grew apples for a purpose. There's a ton of apples. With apples and with, with pears, with, there's quite a few fruits that the variety of flavors are endless. Um, I've had apples that taste like fried chicken. I've had apples that taste like mandarin oranges, vanilla, cinnamon, you name it, gummy bears. You name it, I've had it. Pina colada, that was really good. That one's called the charrette. Um, there's apples with a super high sugar content or bricks. There's apples with high or low acidity. The low acidity apples are the ones that like, it's really weird. You like drink a cider, if you press an uh, apple that has really low acidity, it's almost like eating a banana or something. It's really weird. And, but really good for apple molasses. Um, high tannins, low tannins, good for, good for fermentation, good for like extending the palate. Thick or thin peel. People, had, people chose apples for, for thicker thin peels, amazingly enough, because like a thick peel, you know, makes a pretty good baking apple most of the time. It, dry, it like seals in that moisture. Um, also, a lot of brandy apples happen to be, old timey brandy apples happen to have a really thick peel. Thin peels, sauce, like applesauce. You know, there are sauce apples that like, you throw in a pot and everything disintegrates. There's no, you know, you can like get rid of the seeds, but basically, that's, that's what a sauce apple was. There was no peeling. The, the peel just melted in and it became one. Flesh color and consistency. You know, there's red fleshed apples, green, yellow, um, white, you know, all, all sorts of colors. Um, and the consistency ranges in a huge way. And, and that's when, with, when it's baked and when it's not baked, uh, which is important, like a pie apple, which I, I think I moved that slide. Uh, pie apples, for example, you know, it's a really important characteristic of a pie apple to keep its shape mostly. You know, you want to, you don't want it to have it to be like really crisp, bite into a piece of apple pie that's really crisp. That's gross. So instead, you want something that like holds its shape, but not so much, that gives some flavor, gives some juice. And you see like people covering this up by adding like blends of apples and things like Granny Smith and Macintosh. And you know, that's just because they don't have real apples that make good pies. And then, of course, better pest and disease resistance. Uh, you know, like thick peels really add to the better, disease, better pest resistance because it's a heck of a lot harder. Um, also, like the russeted apples, which is like a sandpaper, um, makes like a, flies don't really like it. Bugs don't really like sandpaper, so they fly off. All right, so this, is, this was my, a picture of my first crop of apples that I decided to grow for hard cider. And um, when, I, when I harvested these and took them to the cider maker, she was, or not the cider maker, the, uh, the cider house owner, she was pretty off-put. Like, she was just like, these are total, totally shit. Like, what? What are you doing? You're charging me $20 a bushel for these, and they're just no good. And I was like, well, you know, I don't think they're no good. They're organic, number one. 
you got a heck of a crop this year, so you know you're going to get a lot of juice. And and you know we kind of like I kind of like zoom, and got out of there real quick. But but then I started talking. This the cider maker called me up uh, after they had pressed them two days later, and and she was like, Eliza, those apples you gave me were by far the best cider apples I have ever used. I was like, oh really? Tell me more. <laughs> and, and she was like, well, number one, the bricks is higher than any other, any other time we've, this is pit mast and pineapple. And she said, well, the bricks was higher than it's ever been. The flavors were intensified. It's almost, it's got like way more spiciness in the cider than it ever has. And there's like this amount, for some reason, when fermenting this out to dry, there's still some residual sweetness. And I just can't explain it. It's like, oh, interesting. And so I had no idea what was going on, you know. And actually, like, this was a real struggle for me in trying to figure out, like, did I, you know, is this, did I really mess up here? <laughs> like, do I need to change my ways? These were my brand new ways, but, you know, how do I need to alter these? So, so I started to look into these diseases. Let me go back real quick. And, all right, so... This is sooty blotch. Uh, this right here and that and that are um, something called water core. This is apple scab. There's fly speck in here. There's, there's also powdery mildew. Uh, most of these are fungal water. Um, yeah, these are the fungal ones that I was finding. And, you know, it was just like, well, it doesn't matter what these apples look like, and it's not affecting, like to me, it's not affecting the apple for this process. So what does it matter? And, and so I started looking into a little bit more, and I was seeing, seeing, oh, well, as it turns out, like, you know, this is a disease that sends the tree into like a reactionary mode. Like, oh my God, we're under attack. We gotta do something about it. I'm being the tree here. We're under attack. We got to do something about it. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna send nutrients that way. Like nutrients go, and so what you see is on the apple, the apples start to accumulate. Um, this might, the apples are starting to accumulate more nutrients. And I have another slide that I'll. Yeah, and so, you know, your polyphenols in the fruit with the presence of these fungal. Um, cosmetic diseases, you know, your polyphenols increase. You have 3.1 times more flavonoids. That's like your anti-inflammatory and your antioxidant levels. 3.9% flavin 3 o which is for like prevention of chronic disease. And your BRICS increases between 3 and 15%, which is huge. That's huge when you're making alcohol. Because um, the higher the BRICS, the higher the alcohol. But also, this was something that I, that I learned that I really got excited about was this whole idea of water core, which I saw in, in the pit mast and pineapple. It's a very susceptible variety. It's caused by like intense, intense heat. Um, and, and so, you know, aspect, it matters with your aspect if you're on like the southwestern side. Um, it's also caused by high vigor. You're going to hear a lot about vigor in this talk. And like tip bearing, so like limber twig or uh, anyway, tip bearing is like an apple that hangs on the tip um, are more susceptible. But the exciting thing about water core, this is like a boon to the commercial industry because people don't want to bite in, well, the United States commercial industry. It's a delicacy in Japan for some reason. but. Um, in the United States, it's a boon, and they're always like, oh, how do we get rid of this? Oh, I know, we'll just pick the apples way before they're ripe so that they don't have time to mature because this is a disease, of, a disease of maturing. But water, co water core is a sorbitol-rich solution, which means that's a non-fermentable sugar. That's a residual sugar that your cider can have, your hard cider can have, by just encouraging this disease. 
So to, to talk to you more about cider for a minute, like a lot of people ferment dry. They'll ferment their whole cider dry, so that means like all the sugars are eaten. And then they'll back sweeten. And they'll back sweeten with either uh, apple concentrate that they made, apple concentrate that they bought, um, or sugar or honey. Um, and, and then you run into this problem of, oh, it's going to keep fermenting, so I better sorbate it. Uh, sorbate kills the yeast, kills the active yeast. And so that's when you run into these issues. Um, these, I, have an, I have an allergy to um, uh, sorbates and things. And so, you know, and, and other people are really not, not into it. So this is, this is huge. This is a quality at its best in terms of a fermentable good, because this means you're going to have a sweeter, a sweeter cider without any of the hassle of, of worrying that it's going to keep fermenting. Your bottles are going to explode. Uh, you know, it's going to, your quality or the taste is going to change because it's fermenting in the bottle still. These are all reasons why people add uh, things to kill the natural yeast. But, <clears throat> And people, and by the way, you're, if you leave here and start talking about all these things to cider makers, they're going to think you're crazy. Um, but that's because they're part of this old school, like, or not. They're just, they're just totally learning. Cider is one of these things, it's like a new frontier in the United States because it hasn't been around since pro, pre-prohibition. And we're, we make the rules, you know? All of a sudden, like, we have a voice in this. And this is real quality, and it's something that, that it can be argued, but it's something that will get people to listen. It's a conversation worth having. Okay, and the other side of all this was I started this new campaign called, well, it's not new, it's a few years old, called Eat Ugly Apples, um, which is starting to like highlight all the cosmetic diseases for people because I thought, well, I'm just going to keep producing for process markets until um, one day people want to buy these for eating. Um, and, so, and so that's where that is all about. That's, that hashtag eat ugly apples is fairly active. I, if I say all of you should use it uh, and especially like tell people how delicious they are, you know, because it matters. But it's also, it becomes a superfood. OK, so <clears throat> the next part of this presentation is going to be in the management aspects of, the, of cider orgening. I, admit I have some lost slides, so I'm going to just make them up with words. I'll go slow. Um, but anyway, when it comes to, I'm like the queen. I like to call, I'm self-titled. Self queen of low input apple management um, because I want to figure out how to grow as cheap, the highest quality product as possible for as cheap as possible. And so, and, and I'm not interested in bringing in all of these goods for, from all, who knows where. Like that, fundamentally I have an issue with that. I really like to think, think about reticulating things on, on my own farm. Um, there are some things I'll talk about that I, about bringing in, but for the most part, I like place-based. Okay, but when it comes to input management and ethics, there's three main things, three main topics I wanna to talk to you about today. The first is water and the effects of water and how important water is. Um, the second is balancing stress. And the third is harvest efficiency. All right, so when I was in Kyrgyzstan a few years ago, um, I was in this particular area of Kyrgyzstan was an isolated stand of apples. And these apples were um, thought to, along with um, the populations in Kazakhstan, be of the you know, original, um, the OG apples. They were like in the, in the motherland. Um, so, I went, to I went to Kyrgyzstan to basically like study what was going on. How are these apples growing? And yeah, there's a lot to chalk to like 
genetics, but there's a lot to learn about like these growing environments that apples are sort of native in. Well, they absolutely are native. They're apple forests. And so I pulled this slide, this graph for you today to talk about water. Um, <clears throat> because what you see here, and this is in millimeters, so this isn't this is an arid climate. Um, and I live in the southeast. I'm in hot and humid uh, climate. Lots of, lots of water. So where this is like 80 millimeters is what, like three inches? So, you know, I get 40 inches. But anyway, let's just extrapolate here and just use, use this. What you see is in Kyrgyzstan where apples are pretty much like disease-free. They don't get a whole lot of pest issues, but, you know, they look really good. Um, you see water just really drops off. And this is, this is the month of July, August, and September. And this, to me, is very, very important. Because this, well, actually, and before I go into that, this graph almost exactly em emulates Washington State as well. And so as water is dropping off, you have heat increasing. And so what this does, to, in, in my mind anyway, is that this is limiting the limiting factor. Water is, water is uh, tapering off in order to give you higher nutritional access, um, a better ability to fight off disease, lower vigor, which I'll talk about vigor, and also um, you're getting more flavors and, and that's all because you're limiting the water. Okay. Okay, so a, tree, a tree's uptake of water, it, in fact, it impacts flavor. Like I said, it impacts sugars. It impacts disease susceptibility. And it impacts uh, the time it takes a young tree to fruit. And I can't remember if I have this. Let's see what my next slide is. Yeah. So this is just an example here. And the things I'm going to point out is that this tree is suffering by too much water, as are many trees in the United States. It's, to me, it's a fundamental problem of, uh, of management and of our, our, what's surrounding our inputs is because not only <clears throat> is there no grass here, and grass is, a com is competition. Grass is uh, taking up water. Um, there is, uh, this is a heavier soil, so it's holding on to that water. It's not necessarily draining. This person butchered the pruning job. Pruning is a big deal. Um, if you over prune, you're going to create vigor, which creates more disease. And. Um, and so anyway, those are some things I'm, I'm going to point out. But All right, so fire blight. This is the number one disease uh, in the United States um, that's like real disease, not like apple scab. Even though apple scab is like that one of those cosmetic diseases why people spray millions of gallons of fungicide. Fire blight is a real disease to me in that it's bacterial and then it becomes systemic and it will kill your tree. It will kill your orchard. And so for me, I've been trying to think, I've been studying for a long time, like, hold on one sec. How can I start to manage fire blight? Manage, for, manage differently so that fire blight is less. And... The answer, again and again, is vigor. So let me talk to you about vigor for a minute. Vigor is when you get like fishing pole sized one year growth out of your, off of your trees. You see it, and you see it a lot, well you'll see it in almost every fruit tree, but I see it, I deal mostly with uh, fruit trees in the family rosaceae, so pears, quince, apples, <coughs> hawthorn. And, <coughs> All of these are very susceptible um, to, to fire blight. But vigor is when, basically, it's, it's, 
It happens more uh, in heavier soils. So your, um, if your soils are storing that water uh, and the trees are able to f drink heavily that water, it'll put that, that, basically the water translates into growth. And so what you do, what ends up happening is you get cell elongation. And when you stretch anything, anything really, you know, it gets thinner, it becomes more susceptible. And that's exactly what's happening is that here, this, these tissues are stretched and they're more, they've become more vulnerable. And as a result of becoming more vulnerable, the fire blight bacteria has just welcomed itself right in and it's killed the whole thing. So, how do we control this? It's, it's the reason why, you know, I don't even know. I, I want to say millions, I'm not sure if that's right, of gallons of uh, antibiotics are sprayed in orchards um, across, the, of, across North America. I mean, it's a serious disease. And so I was thinking, like, I looked towards the conventional guys, and I, and I would, I'd like to emphasize how important it is to look, to base all, maybe not base your work, but really hone in on what the conventional guys are doing because they're doing it for like a real reason that has some backing that supports a cause. But perhaps there's a way for you to tweak that and tweak that information and make it more ethical. And that's what I've been trying to do. Okay, so let's talk about this water for a minute. This is, a, as all, many of you know, is a swale. And I am, if you are in an area with heavy soils and you get a decent amount of heat um, and a lot of rain, I am not a fan of swales, of planting apple trees in swales or pear trees. On top of a swale, on the bottom of a swale, it doesn't matter because what that's doing is that you are allowing this tree to actively drink lots of water. I want this water, in my ideal situation, this water would go and just completely disappear. But in allowing your tree to actively drink all of this water, it's turning that water into, vig into vigor, which is increasing your disease susceptibility, increasing your chance of fire blight. It's it's increasing, um, oh wait, I'll have to go back. It's increasing your chance of fire blight. It's increasing your vegetative shoots to fruit shoots, so you're getting less fruit. And um, what else is it doing? It's doing a couple other things, but I want to go back really quick because there was a, oh, no, oh yeah. I wanted to mention this orchard is on contour here. And that's another issue. You re it's really important to know your soils when you're thinking about planting orchards, food forests, whatever. For production, it's very important to know your soils because you need those soils to get rid of that water, especially if you're going for, prod for, for uh, high quality. You're going for something that's, you know, if you want to produce a high quality fruit, for a high quality niche product that you can sell and you can market, gotta get that water away. But the problem is in this orchard that's on contour, trees in a heavy, once again, this is in the southeast and it does change from climate to climate, but in a heavy soil here um, on contour, those that line of trees acts itself like a soil. And I've seen it over and over again water goes down and it completely, it gets trapped and it gets turned into vigor. And this is a direct result of on contour, which, you know, is so counterintuitive from, from what a lot of us have, have thought about, about, oh, we need to slow down this water. We need, to, we need to let it like slowly seep in, but we need to keep our nutrients on our site a lot, of, a lot of fruit trees don't want nutrients. They thrive in poor soils. They thrive in dry soils. Look at all, you know, if you look at the grapes in like the Merlot region, 
Um, they're growing on very low nutrient, like gravel, practically, that's, that stays pretty dry until, at one point, uh, it's not so dry. So what I would recommend, what, one thing I really recommend when I work with clients is doing a perk test. And because it's, it's important. You can't necessarily, like, I, I use the NRCS soil maps um, heavily and often, but you can't trust them. Like, uh, the K saturation rates, the amount of soil permeability, like, those numbers, even if it says, oh, this, this uh, soil will get rid of half an inch of water in an hour, like, you can't necessarily trust it. And this is very important for when, if you are planting out an orchard, to figure out, it, it helps you to figure out your planting plan. It helps you to figure out um, what your, what your soil is going to do to these trees. But the other thing to consider, this is the kicker here, is that we now are amidst this like wide world of rootstocks. And so all of these are clonal, except for the seedling. But they've been developed to keep trees at the same, at, at a certain specific height, so you can add up in your head what it's gonna take, how many trees per acre can I plant? You know, because then you can say, okay, well, uh, Let's see here, G EMLA 26. Okay, that's like 250 trees an acre that I can plant um, at a certain spacing that I think is comfortable. And it's going in three, four years, it's gonna produce two bushels of apples per tree. So you're looking at like 500, 500 bushels of apples per acre that's the glory of the rootstock. That's why people are using them. And of course, the, today, the smaller the rootstock, the more you can add to an area and the, uh, the more bushels per acre you're actually getting. But attached to, and the larger it's the inverse, but attached to this is roots. So this, of course, the seedling is that's why I call this vigorous, and these are non-vigorous, because this drinks heavily, this drinks pretty heavily, this drinks a little less, and then M7 is actually fairly vigorous as well um, that I've seen, at least in the southeast. And then these others are, so, are not so vigorous. So, but with the non-vigorous, you also have more inputs. They're less able to uh, survive on their own. They're more shorter-lived. They're like the runts kind of, um, where like they're not necessarily converting. They're exactly like the runts, I guess. I'm just thinking about like a little runt pig or something that just like can't put on weight. Um, that's pretty much how it goes. But this is how you can get around. If you've got a really heavy soil and you've got a situation where there's a lot of water coming at you, um, and, and you've got also some heat, it might be worth it to go more towards a dwarfing rootstock because that dwarfing rootstock is going to limit your vigor. Um, if you're going towards a, a larger rootstock, then um, you're going to have vigor. It's going to present some problems, in, probably in the short term. In the long term, probably not as much. So if you can keep it alive, in the short term, then you're likely going to, it'll be okay. It seems to, to me to balance out, like if you, I go fruit exploring a lot, I see a lot of very old seedlings that are disease free just because they're able to access nutrients. But the important thing is training these trees, these vigorous trees in the beginning, if you've got a lot of water, if you've got heavy soils, to, become, to be less disease prone. And if you want, you can go this more uh, dwarfing route to get fruit earlier, to perhaps sip that water in your soil. Um, you'll have to trellis it more than likely, but it's just something you can do. So you can, 
you can constantly, there's a lot of leeway that you have in here, you know. To giving your site, you can pretty much plan for anything, but you have to think about, you have to think about these things. You have to think about rootstock, your soil, your water. Oh no, oh no, I almost made it. Frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay. And so this is a quick slide on, on training. And so if you've planted on M111 or if you've planted on seedling or even 106 or even M7, um, and you've planted, you've grafted like an heirloom or a cider apple variety, more, more than likely those heirloom and cider apple varieties are genetically vigorous from the start. Um, there's a reason why they got zoned out uh, in the beginning when the extension agents took over. And, and that's, a lot of that is the reason. I mean, they're harder trees to take care of. And so, you know, they're, they're not as, um, they're really vigorous, more vegetative growth, less fruit bud growth, until you figure it out. You've got to train them. And this is one of the important things to do early on is, you know, I've stopped, for the most part, I've stopped pruning small trees. Um, I've completely changed the way I do things uh, because pruning in the winter time, so all your, after the leaves fall, all that sap goes into the roots. And then when you prune in the winter time, that sap doesn't have anywhere to go except for into new gro existing growth and then new growth. That new growth that's coming out is like a spurt. Uh, it is vigor in itself. It's like a water sprout oftentimes, um, which is dangerous for disease and whatnot. And so what I've started to do is exactly this, is to tie, tie things down. I'll tie branches to themselves. I, you know, I wrap them around. I'll curly cue it. Um, and the reason for doing this is because this is a hormonal thing. So when I looked at the con conventional guys and what they were doing to control fire blight, they have the spray called Apogee. Apogee is like black magic. It's totally crazy in that you spray the tree and it makes the tree limbs turn from, tr the buds turn from vegetative into fruiting. And so what that does is that causes more energy. So fruiting buds take up more energy and so you're not getting as much vegetative growth because it's all going into fruit. This is doing exactly that, um, only organically, because this is a it's a apogee is a, um, a hormone, a bio something hormone thing, and but if you tie down, if you start to loop your branches down, what you're doing is this. This right here, this growth is um, vegetative. But once you tie those down, that's, that's initiating the fruit, fruit growth, fruit hormones. Um, and it might take you several seasons to do this. But, <clears throat> and, and it depends on like your workforce and whatnot. And this is really an appeal for all these high density systems that are out these days. Like, on trellising, that's part of the reason why it's so successful, is that people are able to just tie down those branches on a wall, on a wire trellis wall. Um, I do this with uh, M111 trees and with standard trees all the time. It takes some time, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it because not only are you reducing your disease pressure, but you're also going to get your fruit a little bit earlier than you would otherwise, and a little bit heavier, because you're initiating that fruit bud growth. How am I doing on time? OK. Oh. What ages are you doing with those trees? Um, usually, like, what age am I doing that on these trees? And it's usually, like, it depends. So if you're, if you receive a tree from that's like well feathered, uh, so it's already got branches, then I do it ex as soon as I get that. And you want to do it actually um, not in the winter time, but as you're approaching 
spring, so sap is flowing in, there's more malleability, you're, not more, you're less likely to break the branches, and so that's when you want to do it. And so it can be year two, it can be, and then, and then just keep doing it until, and you can also, by the way, break slowly these branches down. Um, if you just move your hands like this, and you just hear like crunch, 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 crunch. It's doing the same thing, you're, essentially. So um, you might be thinking, oh my god, I have so many trees, there's no way I can do all of this. But I'm just saying, there's a reason why all these conventional guys spray this stuff, and that's why. You know? And so if you want to not forgo the sprays, this is what it takes so far that I found from, a, from an input. So are you tying okay. those to the ground or back to the trunk itself? Um, do I have to repeat that or can, okay. Uh, I tie them all sorts of ways. I tie them to the trunk. I'll tie them to, sometimes I have a post. I recommend a post. A post is pretty good. Um, but yeah, I'll tie them to the trunk pretty easily. And sometimes I have center block, like a center block that I'll, you know, hook everything into. And you want to get rid of this, uh, you want to get rid of them when probably by summertime because then they start to wear in. Or you can get like leather straps or something <laughs> to make it so it's not going to dig into your branches and girdle them. I'll say next question is, what is what's your medium of tying? A, a rope or... I, a lot of times I use baling twine. Baling wire? Yeah. It's cheapest for me in bulk to do. Is this a established orchard? Yes. Oh. Can you do this to an established orchard? Um, it depends. How old are we talking for established orchards? 20 years. Well, the question, 20 years established orchard, you're... The goal is to have that tree slowing down already. Um, you're probably not going to be able to, I would say no. Because um, that's when, so when you're like pruning, every prune, every cut you make in an apple tree or a pear tree, it, cause, it thickens. Thickening decreases mobility. And so a 20-year-old apple tree, and I can talk about what I do with 20-plus-year-old trees that aren't mine. Um, in a minute too, because I'm going to run out of I'm going to run out of material. Are there any more questions? So with new trees, are you doing any not allowing of fruit to grow on that tree for a certain amount of time, and then allowing fruit to grow at another time? Yeah, uh, the, I I don't like to have a tree produce like a few apples really early on. I'd rather wait and and let that make the push. A little later, like the next Sound year. Tree. Yeah. Are manual thinning? Yeah. Yes, manual thinning is very important um, for annual cropping. For cider fruit, it's not that important. If you're okay with it's it's manual thinning to me is is basically yeah it's just annual cropping. It all boils down to that because fruit size for niche markets doesn't matter. Okay. All right, so this idea of balancing stress. So when, when I mean stress, I mean those fungal problems that, uh, problems that I encountered in that slide above, like just these cosmetic effects. But the thing is, you don't want to have too much stress because too much stress is really it's going to stress your tree. You want to be able to, you got to walk this fine line. And this is something that I, that I am, currently practicing, and I don't have answers for you, but walking this line of what, how can I get the tree to give me these nutritive benefits um, to make like this awesome product while also not really hurting it? What can I give the tree back? Um, my answers so far that I've been doing is I've added uh, pigs to the orchard. I love pigs in the orchard. I have American guinea hogs. Um, I just got a uh, American guinea hog large black cross that um, I'm putting in the orchard this year. But 
They, to me, are an excellent way to remove grass when I need grass removed, which is right after bloom. Right after bloom, when your apples are setting fruit, is like the time when trees need nutrients. Like that's the time because it's like, uh, to me it's like a colostrum or something. You know, right after an animal is born, it needs that colostrum to be, to be set. To me, right after an apple is, a fruit is set, it needs those nutrients to give it that boost, to give it that survivability factor. And having animals, for me, in the orchard right after bloom, or maybe right before bloom, where it's, they're eliminating the grass, they're peeing, they're pooping, and they're eating all sorts of insects, um, and I usually keep them in until um, the apples are like 10 millimeters, and when they drop because of plum curculio, then they also act as a natural insecticide because they're eating the apples with the plum curculio that have dropped to the ground, and so there's no life cycle circle. So big fan of animals. I'm working this year, I'm also going to be working with some cattle in a leased orchard. Um, I don't have a clue how that's going to go, but we'll see. Um, the other things, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Dan Kittredge, but um, I'm, I'm a fan of that guy. And, <clears throat> and I've started adding rock dust from my local quarry. It's so cheap. It costs more to take it away, to like drive it away. I've started, I've started adding rock dust, which is my, parent, my local parent material underneath the trees, to the trees in the fall, late fall. Um, as like a thank you <coughs> to, one sec. <coughs> because when it's, a tree's like shooting up so many minerals and nutrients, you have to replenish that somehow. I also stick the, tr the pigs in the orchard uh, after, after harvest to add additional nutrients and also they're, they're breaking down the leaves, that's fungal infection, they're cleaning the orchard. The animals make a lot of sense. The one, I see you, I'll call you in a minute. Five minutes. Animals make a lot of sense. The Food Safety Modernization Act doesn't seem to think so. Um, so there's a lot of, either you like get a tall fence or you know, you get really, uh, you start thinking really, cleverly about how you do things, or it's like 120 days by har until harvest um, if you're harvesting off the ground that your animals have to be out of there, which you can probably, you'd have to pick a later ripening variety in order to have your pigs in the orchard around bloom and sea minerals. This is like 90 minerals and this is like 50 minerals, you know, just like a, a little boost. Okay. So uh, how large should the trees be before you start running pigs through? I can imagine they'd do some damage if they're too young. I haven't had a whole lot of damage on young trees, but it's because I have, I don't know, maybe it's my breed. Um, I, my, I have them in my, or, in my nursery rows, actually, and the only damage I've encountered is their bodies, like, because they're like lard hogs, so their bodies just like knock them over. Um, they don't seem, like they won't eat the seedling the apple seedlings like it, below the trees. I'm sure that's not across the boards, but you can use electric fencing, you know. I, I would highly recommend electric fencing to, and get them as close as you can. All right, this is an example of, uh, of what I, of my pre, um, no, no, this is orchard cleanup of like, they just, they did the, like this shallow till and then I went back and I, uh, reseeded with a cover crop, and it looks pretty great now. All right, and just quickly, I'll mention harvest efficiency because I have like two minutes. Um, this was that guy I worked for, the 97-year-old man, and this is his five-acre parcel of 170 different apple varieties. And this is where I learned my my lesson: is that not it seemed like no two of these trees were the same variety next to each other. So like his wealthy apple, he was a well, he loved the wealthy apple. And so his wealth, apple, wealthy, 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 
wealthy. And then, you know, everything else in between. Nothing was next. Everything was ripening at a different date. And I would encourage you all to really strong, this is very, very important, to plan your orchards out for harvest. So the average migrant worker works by the bin. They pick into a bin, they get paid by the bin, it ends up being like the best pickers get like 12 bucks an hour, the equivalent, but it's, it's bin based. There's no way, there was no way I was gonna get one of these guys, ultra efficient migrant workers in to harvest this. He wouldn't make any money because he'd have to go this way. No crew was gonna take that on. I, and in areas where you don't get migrant labor or, I'm, which I don't use really, um, I usually pay $10 an hour. You're gonna save a lot of money if you have lines of things ripening at the same time. That's just how it is. If you wanna cut your cost and, and cutting, cutting your harvest cost, cut your in price, which will make it more available, make these fruits more available to a larger amount of people. It's very important. You can, you can, persimmons, apples, pears, plums, peaches, you name it, they've all, all the, there's thousands of cultivars, or named or not named. This is, that information needs to be known. That information needs to be started. It, I, I've started it in a way, some other people have started it, but like from a permaculture community, you know, that's heavy on, oh, it's okay, that's heavy on diversity within an orchard setting, it's very important to get your harvest times right so that you can pick it. And uh, yeah, so that's my bit on harvest efficiency. Yes? So I can just talk about it. Oh, I can repeat. So if you are buying fruit from a, uh, a nursery, in upstate New York or Maine or something like that, and they give you a harvest date, and you plant it in Pennsylvania, how, do you, how does that change the, the ripening time? And if the extension has no clue what variety you have? You so that it, you have to think about it as a class. So like first week of September, you know, there's a lot of fruits that ripen in the first week of September. Um, if that's in Maine, then you just think, okay, that's gonna be sometime in August. Like, that's what, that's what you do. The, that class of fruits, they're gonna ripen at the same time, more than likely, together, just earlier or later, depending on where you are. So you can still group over that way. Yeah, and if you've planted this stuff, um, you can always bud graft. You know, you can top work the trees over. You can get these, you can get the timing right. It just, it, and that's really imperative, but it's gonna absolutely take that, you know. I have a grafter I work with, and he's really fast, and, and we've, we've repaired some properties and things, but it's no, you know, all is not lost.